Hi, my name is Nate Bresno of the University of Bremen. Welcome to my webinar series recording. This is session four, Advice and Information on Computational Reproductions. And this is my talk today, Advice and Information on Computational Reproductions. Students may find them messier than expected. Move my video out of the way. So, by now, you've heard talk of the reliability crisis, and here's just a quick overview. References to replication crisis by year and discipline in four major social science disciplines. And as you can see, it's increased markedly since the mid 2010s. So just a real quick reminder, what are we talking about with the reliability crisis? Well, there's this new genre of research called the many analyst study. And in these studies, many researchers come together and are given the same data and asked to test the same hypothesis. Yet, in almost all of these studies across all different disciplines, researchers come to a wide variety of results. There's actually a list of these studies, which is growing quickly, held by Balaj Uxe. And you can find uh, links to this and to these slides at the end of the video. So essentially what we know about is that there's researcher variability. And this is maybe not surprising because researchers often approach their work with a different theory, different method. The researchers themselves have some idiosyncratic approaches to how they do things and somehow there's variability in the results. So in other words, social and behavioral science is not 100% replicable and nor should we expect it to be. However, there is one exception and that's the computational reproduction. So in a computational reproduction, what one does is tries to take the same code and reproduce the exact results from a study using the exact same data. And what I'm gonna do today is report results from a study that I was involved in along with my colleagues, uh, Eike Mark Linke and Alexander Wutke where we got together 187 researchers into 85 teams, one to three researchers per team. And we replicated an important study in my area, which is uh, social policy research. And that is, does immigration undermine public support for social policy, which you can see down in the lower right-hand corner, excuse me there, um, published in the American Sociological Review. And so their task was to replicate this study by David Brady and Ryan Finnegan. However, there was a twist. Um, we gave them an experimental condition. So half of the teams were randomly assigned into a transparent group, which was given the paper, the appendix, the Stata code, and basically is as transparent as one might expect from a study. We had also, as the principal investigators, checked that the code does run and produce the same results. And then the other half were in an opaque group. And in this group, they did not receive the original paper there were some adjustments made to the results um, to try to hide the um, original paper. And they were not given any code and they were given only a method section which loosely described what was done in the paper. So maybe the least <laughs> transparent possible condition. So in this study, um, we had three three methods of testing reliability and computational reproducibility. And so the first, um, the first format was verification. That is that they would just come to the same sign. So in, a re in their regressions, did they get a positive, a negative, or not significantly different from zero coefficient? And then we had exact replication, where they would come within 0 0.01 of the exact numerical result of the original study. And then we had what was called replication error, which you can see along the bottom there. And that is, what is the absolute value of their numerical result from the original study's coefficient? Now, in the original study, there were several regressions run. And so each team tried to produce a certain number of these same regressions. And that meant that we had 3,172 effect level um, results, so one for each coefficient, 
but then we also had a, a team level result where there's 85 teams. And here we called verification if 95% or more of the team's coefficients were a verification and an exact replication at the team level where 95% or more of the team results um, were an exact replication. And then we had, of course, team level error, which is the average error at the team level. And so essentially, the green bars are the transparent group and the blue bars are the opaque group. Now, again, the transparent group was sort of the best possible condition of open science, right? And so you can see along the top there, um, at the effect level, 95.7% of the transparent group verified, so came to the same directional result uh, with their coefficients. The opaque group less so at 89.3%. Maybe not bad, one might say. But then if we really look at an exact numerical replication, which we might expect in a computational reproduction, that they came within 0 0.01, only 76.9% of the transparent group came to an exact replication. Again, the green bar in the second row on the left. And 48.1% of the opaque group came to an exact replication. So much worse results. Now you can see at the very bottom, uh, the transparent group had 0 0.013 average error. Um, these are actually um, a logistic regression and the coefficients are converted into odds ratios. So that's not so easy to interpret, but what you can see clearly is the bar for the green group, TG, and the bar for the purple group, OG, are very far apart. Um, the opaque group had almost seven times more error. At the team level, results are less um, strong. I'm going to move my video box out of the way. I hope Zoom reflects that as well. So at the team level now, uh, we see that 79.5% of the 85 teams uh, were able to verify 95% or more of all the results. So there's what that's telling us is that there's a lot of um, there's a little bit of error in a lot of teams, if, if you could put it that way. And the opaque group was less so. And when it came to an exact replication, almost nobody in the opaque group could produce the same numerical results. Again, the opaque group had did not have the numerical results or the code. They just had a method section that described the results and gave them uh, the directionality of the results, although it did describe how to construct the models. So what are the sources of error? And this is what's particularly important for this webinar, because I know that many of you students have already started replication. You're interested in replication. You want to know what, what happens when one does a replication. Well, this is what we found. Uh, 29, <clears throat> um, We found, excuse me, we found 29 mistakes made in 24 teams. And a mistake is really something that we were certain that if we informed the team, uh, that they would see it themselves as a mistake. So something that they didn't intend to do. These were things, for example, um, when the teams were writing their code. Um, they may have cut and pasted snippets of code and forgot to change the variable name so that they, they created four models that were identical instead of four different models with four different dependent variables. Um, mistakes were if they uh, one team reported coefficients instead of odds ratios, even though we asked for odds ratios. Um, and then we found even more instances, <clears throat> excuse me, of procedural error. Now, procedural error is something that looks like it may not have been a mistake. For example, it, teams use different um, packages or different versions of the software, or um, they were using, um, they, they rounded to two decimal places instead of three or even one decimal place in, in rare cases. And then there were some in between that were um, mistake procedural. And these, these were mostly in the opaque group because the opaque group didn't have the original code. And here's a real 
maybe important side point. Um, as real typical in economic socio-political research, there were some variables used in the regression that identified people's labor market status. And these usually came from a combination of variables. And unless you really read the code carefully, one could easily um, make different coding choices. For example, the definition of unemployed uh, as being not in the labor market or in the labor market and how to define unemployed. If one is reports working zero to five hours a week, would that be considered unemployed? So there were all these very subtle choices, which are very common in research using survey data, which is this research. Um, there were some rare cases, like in four teams, where they were just blatantly missing a component in the uh, study. And there were um, three teams where they interpreted even though we thought it was clear what was written in the methods section, they interpreted it in a slightly different way. Um, and so naturally their models were different and came to different results. Um, and finally, there were three teams. Um, we, we surveyed the teams on their, their skill set and their experience. And there were three that had questionable method competencies. For example, one was using Stata for the first time. And so we weren't sure if this was a ecologically valid um, reflection of what real research might look like, at least not research aiming to publish um, or, or be presented at a higher level. So what predicted, so that was the qualitative portion and those are the things to watch out for. And so what predicted these errors? And let's just go somewhat quickly through these regression tables. So you can see, you know, what predicts a verification here. And we have pooled means all the teams together and really, when the researchers reported themselves that it was a difficult task, we again surveyed them before and after the study. If they reported it was a difficult task for them, they were less likely to come to a verification. And this was really the only, let's call it, you know, significant in the in, um, NHST uh, p-value testing perspective, uh, significant coefficient. Um, but what we could see when we broke it down into the transparent group alone, um, that those using Stata were more likely to verify the study. And again, the original study was in Stata, so this is maybe not surprising. Um, if they had higher statistics skills, they were slightly less likely to verify, which we found somewhat interesting. And of course, if they reported difficulty. In the opaque group, using Stata didn't matter, again, uh, the original results were generated with Stata, but they didn't have the Stata code. So this is, you know, number one predictor, let's call it. And when you take away the Stata code, the results become distributed equally across R and Stata and the few teams that were using uh, SPSS. Now, what predicts an exact replication? Results here are again somewhat similar, um, namely that. If you're given the Stata code and you're a Stata user, you're more likely to get the exact replication. Um, and then what predicts replication error? Again, results are somewhat similar there. So again, we qualitatively coded their code, if you will. And so what predicted um, mistakes or procedural sources of error in the pooled group? Again, difficulty and uh, being in the um, being in the opaque group, so the experimental condition were the big predictors. Um, now, interestingly, those in the transparent group, uh, again, we have this, this uh, if they're a user of Stata, they make less error, but if they have higher stats, statistic skills reported, like they published in statistics journals, et cetera, uh, taught statistics courses, they were slightly more likely to make a mistake. Now, when we looked more carefully at this, um, the stat skill and the difficulty scores are somewhat collinear. So they may be picking up um, each other's uh, co-variation there. Um, and the similar results for procedural. Again, we can talk more about these regression tables in the discussion, which I look forward to. So let's just come to the conclusion now, which is that 
verification via replication, or let's say really a computational reproduction is not 100% reliable. Um, what are the big factors that we could identify? So things to watch out for in your own replication or the sharing of your replication results with others or sharing of your work. If you want others to come to the same results, practice open science. So in other words, the group that had access to all the materials had a 95% plus replication rate, at least at the effect level. Now, the group that had very little access, a really a worst case scenario, somewhat unrealistic to be fair, because they didn't even have numerical results, just a report of the direction and significance of coefficients. Um, this had a much lower replication rate. This would be the number one thing. Um, now, again, this isn't something that you can control as the replicator. So here comes the next part is the quality of the replication. So if the replicator is really motivated and has strong attention to detail, has some statistics training, this is helpful, which of course doing replications can build. Um, this really leads to a higher likelihood of the same computational numerical results. But interesting and something that we also cannot really control, computing environment matters a lot. So if the original study was in Stata, a computational reproduction is much more likely if it's done by a Stata user. And this is something that is difficult to control. Um, now, something to keep in mind here, the if we pool this all together and say we've got the best case and the worst case and somewhere in the middle is, is the reality of it, you know, if this is an ecologically valid experiment, um, the success rate is 92.7%. If we trim it, you know, so we take out the worst, um, the, the, the tails of the distribution, we come to 95.2%. So not bad, one might say. But at the team level, when we pool the success rate, it's down to 72.1% or trimmed 74%. And again, team level meant that at least 95% of the within team results were a successful um, verification. Um, it's hard to say if this is generalizable, and we'll leave that to the discussion, but I just want to present you with one more simulation here, and that is, you know, how reliable are replications? Well, what we have is the binomial probability that a single replication is accurate. So that is really just how likely is it that one replication comes to a verification, you know, just one replication, one, one coefficient, if you will, here. And this is the likelihood of that starting at 100 at the bottom. And so if you look at the purple line, for example, if we use a 90% you know, confidence interval, threshold cutoff, um, the purple line would say that in one replication, we're going to get um, a, a high 100%. Um, excuse me, in, let me start over. It's, just, it's quite technical. So let's say the probability is 95%. Uh, so the 95 on the um, x-axis. In the purple line, we need only one replication to be reliable. And reliable, I've just made up a definition, but that would be that over, that a majority of replications come to the correct result. So we would only need one replication. But 90% is perhaps not the best threshold. So if you look up at the blue line, at 95% uh, probability that any one replication comes to a verification, you would need three replicators because you would then need that at least two of them are going to come to the correct result 95% of the time. And if that's a little unclear, we can again talk about it in the discussion. And if we up that confidence threshold to 99%, um, we also would need three replicators. But if the probability drops below 95%, again, our study suggests that the sort of real world probability could be below 95%, but depends on the conditions, right? Um, then the replication accuracy uh, drops and you need up to five replicators to come to the result that a majority would come to a verification. And so I wanna thank you for your attention today. And this is just a little food for thought as you're conducting your replications and deciding how you will share your results. And uh, hopefully it motivates you to pay a lot of attention to detail and practice open science.